Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christian Roberts. I'm the Director of Education at the Dallas Opera. I am here with my fabulous friend and co what is it? Co co moderator and co host. Um, you know her and me from Taking the Stage. Um, this is our opening panel for our TDO Connection series here at the Dallas Opera. Yes, I am your co-moderator. My name is Quodicia DeVay Johnson. I also go by Quo Johnson. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, thank you for joining us for today as the Dallas Opera. We are always mindful of the stories we tell and what it means for us to be stewards of those stories and what it means for us to be stewards of truth telling. So to begin our conversation, we'd like to start with the land and people acknowledgement. As an organization, again, that focuses on storytelling, we also focus on truth telling. We do want to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Caddo, Wichita, and Comanche sovereign nations of human beings who lived and who worked with and on the land since time immemorial. We also want to acknowledge that people were stolen from their homes off the coast of Africa and brought here and forced into free and enslaved labor. From that free and enslaved labor, we have what we now enjoy as Dallas. We do this never to place blame on anyone at any time here. We all inherited these conditions, just like I've inherited the last name Johnson, and Ms. Roberts has inherited the last name Roberts. With this inheritance comes our responsibility to tell the truth, but also comes the honor to tell the truth, the honor to make connections within our communities, the honor to build greater communities and connections going forward. So we thank you for joining us for this land and people acknowledgement. Thank you, Quo. You know, our commitment to truth telling, as we explore some of the uh, themes and operas that we present, you're gonna hear a lot about that today. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we're gonna try to do today is to look at the brain and the heart, the connection between the brain and the heart. And that's the connections of the characters within these works, but also the, con uh, the connections and the uh, of our own characters in our own real time, in our own real lives. So we're gonna be taking a look at that today. Um, as we know, art reflects real life, mm -hmm. and um, that is the goal when we put operas on stage. And when we developed the concept for this particular discussion, we wanted to pay attention to what is really happening with the brain when we experience conflict, when we experience trust, what's happening with the heart and the brain when we are creating art. Uh, as I say so often throughout the field, in opera, we put a hole in the wall and in the ground and then we play pretend. And that is not to diminish the work that we do, that is to show how fascinating and how amazing the brain and the heart are when it comes to creating stories, telling stories, and bringing people together. So I want to um, dive in a little bit. I want to thank you all, first of all, for joining us for this conversation. Um, and I'm looking at my panelists today, and we have some brilliant minds up here today, so I'm very excited for this. I cannot introduce them and give them the, the credit that they deserve, so I'm going to allow them to do that for themselves. So let's start with Dr. Cheryl Edinburgh. Hi, my name is Dr. Cheryl Edinburgh. I am the owner and operator of the Tree of Life Birth Counseling and Wellness Center, where we focus on mental and maternal wellness and health. I'm also the owner and operator of a 501c3 nonprofit in which we then turn around and do all those things for people who are not able to have those things done due to financial reasons. Um, I am happily married. Yeah. I have three amazing adult sons. I have seven beautiful grandbabies, two on the way. Uh, I am the midwife for one of them. <laughs> um, I'm super excited about that. And I love life, I love love, and I love people. And I'm happy to be here, thank you. Now y'all have to follow that up. I'm just- <laughs> You can do it. <laughs> I think there's a challenge there. Ms. Hilda? Yeah. Uh, my name is Hilda McClure. I'm an LPC here in Dallas. My, I'm a COO of Canenta Center for Healing, and we focus on providing bilingual and culturally competent services for the Hispanic community. Um, within that work, we started a foundation to um, raise money to be able to provide services and have access, right? Just not in terms of language, but also financially. Um, and with that, there's also we also work on making sure that bilingual clinicians have what they need to to be able to serve the, the community. On a more personal note, um, I'm married. Uh, we don't have any kiddos. We are the millennials that are ruining the baby industry, but um, <laughs> we do have one, one, 
one, one really precious, sweet baby dog. And um, my husband and I love the arts. My husband actually has been in musical theater for a really long time. And so um, there's a lot of musical music in our home. Nice. Yeah, and so that's always been really fun. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to be here. Fabulous. I, I have questions for him later, because I'm like, all of a sudden, Rent starts playing through my head. Yeah. And if you don't have that soundtrack, I have yeah. questions. Um, at any given time <laughs> in our conflict, as we get into it, there, there might be singing um, that happens. And um, that's a great icebreaker for us in our oh, yeah. own conflict. Yeah, yeah. As there should be. Well, and that leads right into our, our next person, mm -hmm. which is uh, Mr. Adam. Would you introduce yourself? I'm Adam DeRose. I'm a stage director and music director in opera and musical theater. Woo. And I'm from Dawson Creek, BC, up in Canada. Uh, and I'm down here at Dallas Opera for the first time. Very happy about that. Assistant directing on the upcoming production of Tosca. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good one, too. Yeah. Speaking of conflict, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I, look, you want to just dive right on in? Yes. All right, yes. let's dive in. So um, I have a question for Cheryl first, uh -huh. um, Dr. Cheryl. She worked hard for that. So as a therapist, midwife, and a licensed professional counselor, can you provide us with a brief definition of conflict and where does conflict arise? Conflict um, is a natural phenomenon of human interaction. Yeah. Mm. Say okay. that again for the people. One uh -huh. more time. <laughs> conflict is a natural phenomenon of human interaction. Um, conflict doesn't have to be bad. Actually, conflict can be really good because if done correctly, it can create, it can provide, it can discover, it can explore, it can do many, many things, but when done incorrectly, it can destroy. It can wreak havoc, it can break down, it can cause confusion. So conflict are struggles that can arise during active disagreements of opinions or interest. And many times this comes about due to differences of opinion, um, the way we perceive things, um, the thought that there is a need for competition. Um, when you don't understand roles and responsibilities correctly. Um, and what I've found as a therapist, a lot of times conflict um, is there due to intrapersonal issues things that haven't been solved within yourself. Mm -hmm. And they manifest in what we call conflict. Fire. I mean, <laughs> abs absolute fire. Um, and so what I'd like to ask kind of each of you, as we say, the brain and the heart, can each of you share kind of some of your thoughts of what that means for the brain and the heart? What comes to mind in your different professions when I say, oh, we're going to have a conversation about the brain and the heart, and we'll start with Adam. The first thing that comes to mind for me is how we make decisions. Mm -hmm. So how, how we respond to things. Um, and also, given what I do, uh, the idea of objectivity also comes into play. So it's whether we're approaching things from more of an emotional standpoint uh, or maybe from like a, a logical or a rational standpoint. Um, and part of that can have to do with objectivity, whether we're in the middle of this conflict or whether we're observing it from afar. Nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Um, because when we think about the brain and the heart, um, they are connected by a very complex network of nerves and hormones mm -hmm. and neurotransmitters. The brain sends signals to the heart through our autom automatic nervous system and it definitely regulates heart rate and blood pressure. Um, the heart and the brain, they influence each other a great deal and they both work together to ensure that we have health and that we function well. Um, so for me, my whole motto is mind, body, and spirit. You can't do anything. The body won't go where the mind won't take it. Hmm. And sometimes the heart is broken because the mind can't make sense out of what it sees and hears. Hmm. And sometimes the brain can't function and rationalize because the, the heart is all over the place. They act together. 
it's a very intimate relationship. You cannot expect one to work if you don't attend to the other. And so mind, body, and spirit, when you talk about the brain and you talk about the heart, you talk about the whole person. Yeah. And so then the question becomes, when you're dealing with conflict, do you really deal with the whole person? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's hard to follow up. Um, but, you got it. <laughs> but to, to, to me or Dr. Cheryl, I think we live, um, when you mentioned that to me or when I think about that, I, I think we live in a really interesting society that that makes us choose, Ooh. right? Like to either we're going to be logical and rational and like that's what makes a, ba a good business person or that makes you really good at making decisions or right or we'll like kind of stigmatize anyone who's like emotional or like making an emotional decision when in reality living wholeheartedly or as a whole person is really the integration of both. Um, you know, a, like a couple decades ago, there was a, like a really big thing about e either being left-brained or right-brained, right? And as new brain research has emerged, what they found is that wellness is like both, yeah. right? Like it's you that, that whole connection, brain. the whole yeah. brain, <laughs> right? Whole connecting, just... connecting that logic and that emotion. Yeah. And when we talk about stare, uh, storytelling, that's what it is, right? Like Absolutely. we feel an emotion and then we tell a story about it right, with that left side. And so how do we as a culture, as a people, move to where it is about the whole person, where we're like, it, one is not better than the other, but when they're actually working together, we have like really beautiful outcomes. Beautiful, Ooh. thank you for sharing. That's loaded, <laughs> that's good stuff. I told y'all this was gonna be fire. All right, um, so my next question, um, this is actually directed to you, so we'll go back to you. Um, you're a licensed professional counselor. Similar to, similar to our friend here. Um, you have a background in trauma. Mm -hmm. Can you provide us some insight um, concerning the impact of conflict um, and how, in, how it impacts individuals and how it impacts groups? Absolutely. So I think first we need to understand that conflict in of itself is not bad, right? Like we're going to have conflict. That is kind of the, the way of, of being human. It's how we manage it, mm -hmm. right? And so our trauma, our baggage, our history will actually play a huge role in how we manage conflict. So um, if, you, if you had a lot of conflict in your home that led to a lot of disruption, as a human adult, going into conflict could be actually really scary, kind of initiating that fight or flight uh -huh. in you, even if it's not the exact same thing, because trauma, right, lives in our body. Um, and so the, the big part of it is like, becoming aware, mm -hmm. right? Becoming aware, okay, so when I, when I enter into conflict, whether my spouse or at work, what is it, what's the fear? Like, what is driving that? What is my history with conflict growing up, right? We get so many of our patterns from our childhood, from our parents, and then from there kind of working to make changes of appropriately. And then when we talk about group and group conflict, now it's not just like me and my stuff or me and my spouse's stuff, it's me and 15 other people's stuff and we're all bringing it to the, to the room and their trauma could, could trigger my trauma, right? Like, and, and, and so it, it becomes, um, because our nervous systems are connected, right? It, it becomes everyone's trauma, right? Like, and in a way, the, the way we relate to one another. So this, this idea of conflict and not being able to do it well, right, can wreak havoc kind of across the board, that idea of destruction. Mm -hmm. Nice. So human beings, yeah. being human, yeah. Who knew? <laughs> and the beautiful thing about this, now I promise y'all, this is the Dallas Opera. <laughs> We're gonna get there. And the reason we have this conversation is because so much happens when we are creating operas, when we are presenting operas. There's a whole, whole, whole slew of things and work and effort from all these amazing human beings who do things before we even get it to stage, before we even get it to you, right? Uh, and so my next question is for Adam, as uh, the assistant director for Tosca, you've also worked on other uh, operas, including Electra. Can you start to bring some of that connection to the conflicts in those operas and the things that you've observed? Yeah, absolutely. So if we think about art as being um, either a response to or observations on or like a reflection um, of the human experience, then we see conflict through art as well. And um, Dr. Cheryl started talking about different types of conflict, and that can be um, 
internal conflict, okay. interpersonal conflict, or it could be we see person versus nature, person yeah. versus society, mm -hmm. person versus person, um, and these are all depicted throughout these these works that are a reflection of our of our human experience. Um, so every every show um, is is rife with conflict, um, and in this season in particular, we we see. Um, some political conflict, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. person versus society in Tosca. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we see a lot of person versus person in Electra. Um, mm -hmm. Diving Bell is got a lot of internal uh, conflict, but also um, kind of person versus nature or person mm -hmm. versus circumstance. And then in in Romeo and Juliet, there's a lot of, of person versus person. Uh, <laughs> person versus everybody. Person oh, yeah. versus family. Everybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> family versus family. Right. Nice. Um, so, opera above all is is a form of communication, right? Mm -hmm. And the theater um, is is communication. So we we depict these experiences um, to elicit some sort of response from our audience. Yes. Um, and as a director, part of what we do uh, is try to shape that response, right? Tell the story in a certain way um, that, that will affect the audience um, in a particular way. There's only so much you can control in that as, right. because as we mentioned, every person's lived experiences are different. So the way that they're, they're going to respond is different. And whether someone in the audience sees the performance happening and, and is more uh, of an observer or whether they get really invested uh, mm -hmm. can depend on a lot of things from the performance itself to to um, that particular audience member. Beautiful. And so I'm hearing that so much of what we do in opera really does center around the storytelling and human experiences, which will naturally include conflict and how we manage it makes a difference. And so directors are being mindful of this when you're engaging in storytelling. It's up to the audience to kind of determine, and that not just so much up to, but audience lived experiences start to determine how they engage with the work. But directors are mindful that we are in fact presenting conflict, sometimes conflict management, sometimes dispute resolution on stage when we're telling these stories, yeah? Yeah, and and with with opera being communication, and we are and and storytelling, um, communication I think is is key to how we respond, how we deal with conflict. Mm -hmm. So, in addition to opera being a form of communication itself, we'll also see the communication on stage. And in in a show like Tosca or Romeo and Juliet, breakdowns in communication lead to oh, the yeah. the eventual uh, demise demise yeah. of the characters. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, um, that is, and, and that's when we say that art reflects real life. Like we're yeah. literally putting human emotion on stage. We're putting the human condition on stage. And, you know, stage directors and the creative teams, you know, they feel the weight of that responsibility. Um, it re requires you to think in context of not only the time period in which the piece was set, but also what's going on in society at the time. Right. A lot of the times you see people and they will take an old work and they try to put a modern spin on it or try to be provocative. And a lot of the times these works speak for themselves. I, I don't need to set Tosca in a modern setting. You can, you know, but I don't need to do that because the story speaks for itself. I mean, there is revolution going on. There is, you know, plenty of problems between her and the, and the corrupt sheriff, you know, all of these different things that are causing problems. So 100% on that. I wanted to dive a little bit into the, to the last opera that we're doing of the season. We're gonna be bouncing around, you know, going back and forth. There's plenty of conflict in these operas to go around. Make sure you um, watch them. <laughs> but I wanna pose this question to Dr. Cheryl because we see in Romeo and Juliet, um, you know, these kids are, they're, you know, of course they are, dismissed or reduced to being, oh, just, you know, bratty, you know, dramatic teenagers, mm -hmm. you know, hormonal, old, you know, and we see the disaster that comes, comes from that. And we leave it at the fact that, oh, they're, you know, they're dramatic. But what we ultimately see is a, a dynamic between two families, and they don't even know what the conflict is between the two families. They fall in love, and like Adam was talking about earlier, a communication leads to, uh, or lacking communication, or miscommunication leads to their demise. In your work with families, can you share the impact that such circumstances have on the children? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, just to 
So the family unresolved conflict, family drama, <laughs> family dysfunction, family trauma, all this unresolved has a huge impact, not just on our children, but our future. Let's be clear, our children is our future. So what are we preparing them for? How are we preparing them is important. Because what I see is that when families have this unresolved conflict within their families, we have children that present with cognitive dysfunctions, um, suicidal ideation, suicidal attempts. We have children with self-harm, anxiety, depression. I've seen so many children with anxiety and depression, and I'm thinking to myself, you haven't even lived long enough <laughs> to have the woes of the world, to be worried about what tomorrow is going to be. Let's be clear, that's what anxiety is, worrying about something that you can't control and have no control over. Or depression being so heavily laden with all of the negative emotions that you don't even want to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. So when I see a little one sitting before me with these issues going on, I wonder where did they come from? They came from their family of origin. They live it every day. Mm -hmm. So it has a negative outlook, but what's even worse is that when you have children that become a product of their environment, mm -hmm. they don't have the tools to resolve conflict, so they just perpetuate it. Mm -hmm. Whether it be in their homes, in their work life, in their friendships. Um, and so we have this cycle going on and then you have people who get to a place when it's time to do conflict resolution, their minds are so shut off to it because they've never been introduced to it, they've never heard it, they've never seen it, to where all you have, again, is perpetuation of conflict. And so what I've seen is I've seen angry children, um, I've seen hurt children, I've even worked with a family who was dealing with parental alienation. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, no one is hurt. You guys are mad at each other. And the only person really being hurt in this situation is the child that's sitting over in that corner biting their fingernails off. Mm -hmm. That has no way of having a voice in this situation. They didn't ask for it. They have no voice in this situation. So... Um, the unresolved conflict results in future situations in which we have unresolved conflict. Mm -hmm. And we see that very clearly in Romeo and Juliet mm -hmm. um, and until its ultimate end. Um, and it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. And again, this is a piece that was written a long time ago and set in, a, in long ago, right? And um, can I just add to that? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So I also want to make sure that I turn around and say conflict isn't a problem. It gives us an opportunity to choose healing. So even some of these children that I work with, adolescents, let's say, sometimes it's just a matter of how long before you graduate? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what you need to do between now and then. And giving them the opportunities to create for themselves an ideal of what they want. Mm -hmm an idea of the life they want to live, an idea of the relationships they can build. Because as a living witness, I know you can come from a family of dysfunction and you can create a family of healing. Mm -hmm. And even in that family of healing, you have to set up healthy boundaries that if you have to protect that, you'll do it by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> well, anyway, that's all we have for our show today. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Whew, that was that was fire. Um, so that sort of leads me into a question for you because you work specifically with youth. Yeah. Yeah. You created an organization um, for supporting youth and families. What are some of the things the adults and the community could have done to help these young people? Absolutely. So. The, so the, let me give you a little bit of background. So the work I did was with domestic violence. And so I worked with the kiddos and the youth and um, we did assessment and just trying to help them move towards healing, right? And so the first thing is understanding that when we talk about trauma, when we talk about like the, the results of conflict, right? Um, for these kiddos, they need, the research shows that the biggest thing is one positive relationship. And um, it seems that when we think about trauma in the big scope, it can kind of feel overwhelming, but the research over and over again, why we have jobs, right, is that, is that positive relationships bring about healing. Um, and so when we talk about 
kids um, and, and teens, I think what adults often forget is that if you're a parent, you're it. Yeah. Right? And so I think a lot of times conflict inherently makes us selfish. Mm. It's about us being right, us being seen, us being heard, whatever. But when we are talking about the stewardship of, of young people, of children, it, it's really the call to step out of that and mm -hmm. give voice and space for our children to express whatever. Um, a lot of times we kind of, even in Romeo and Juliet, right, like so often they're dismissed as dramatic, but there's, there's biological reason for that, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're in, a, in a journey of identity and exploration and, and their brains are changing and hormones are coming on board. And a lot of times we just blame it on hormones or brain changing and, and we disregard that what they're experiencing is their reality. And when we can invite them into a conversation, we don't always have to take it, like we take everything with a grain of salt. We can still give them space and voice for whatever's going on. And you'd be surprised at even just listening, not giving advice, not trying to change anything, changes outcomes for them. Absolutely. Right, like it, it, it becomes like in, in ed, any conflict, in every, everyday conflict, right? A lot of times we just wanna be heard and that doesn't change for our youth. Um, but oftentimes they're dismissed or they're like, kids are resilient. Yeah, and I can't that, 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 that is something that irks me because I'm like, you say they're resilient and then things begin to show up in their adult lives. And we know that, you know, it, 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 there's a scar still there. Absolutely. You know, and what's underneath it. You know, sometimes when you have a scar, it's still tender under there. Yeah. You know, really. So that's real talk. And then I think another question, even building on resilience, is how do you define resilience? Yeah. Is it they don't have the faculties just yet to communicate what they're mm -hmm. experiencing? So mm -hmm. we, we take their silence for mm -hmm. acceptance. We take yeah. their silence for, oh, it's working. Yeah. And doing the same for adults. When we look at Romeo and Juliet, when we look at Electra, because those are some very family-specific mm -hmm. circumstances that we have in these operas, it really does allow us, in all the drama and all the glory and all the, every, ooh, this is opera, right? And all of that, because <laughs> we're still gonna enjoy that. But it really does allow us to dive a bit deeper into how these families have impacted the characters themselves and the mm -hmm. responses of those characters. Why Electra responds the way she responds. Mm -hmm. Why Romeo and Juliet behave the way they behave. Mm -hmm. And when we take a deeper look, again, as we're telling human stories, we then start to see the humanity in these characters we've loved for a very, very long centuries, both. Yeah. Both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, both Greek tragedy, right? Yeah. We, these, these stories have been around for so long, and that human element, that connection, sometimes the fascination, sometimes the resonance yeah. that comes with... Well, oh, we even, we're even looking at, when we look at Diving Bell, which is a new work. Right. I mean, we, there's a movie, you know, but the... the the things that he had to go through, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? The fact that you are left locked into your body, you don't have any way of communicating except for your, your what is it, left eye blinks. Mm -hmm. That's how he, he chose to do a system of Morse code and the level of trust that had to be built between him Absolutely. and the person Absolutely. that was writing it down and communicating for him and that his, that his, his lived experience in that body now, the fact that you, you said it best that he's dealing with nature you know, he's, it's a conflict between him and nature. You know, this is somebody that was a, a husband and a father. You know, so now he doesn't get to interact with his family like he used to. This had to be very, very difficult. Um, and so it's a very human thing to do when we look at these works, whether they're 300 years old, 400 years old, or in this case, I mean, not even tw you know, 20 or 30 years old. I mean, the opera is brand new, but the his book came in, what, 1997? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about something that's happening in, in modern times, you know, um, that things that, there is nothing new under the sun. Um, and the fact that we're sitting here talking this day, talking today about a 400-year-old art form. Let's be clear, it's 400 years old, and the stories that we are telling still have implications for life today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so my next, that brings us right to our next question for Adam. As we as we look at these human stories, we also have to be mindful of the human beings telling those stories. Yes. 
And what happens, we, for those who are, who have experienced kind of the rehearsal space, the art making space, those who have been keeping up with conversations in the industry, right, in Opera America, throughout the opera industry, there's a lot of conflict happening. There are a lot of things um, artists need, that directors need, stage need, right, crew, all mm -hmm. of these things. There's a lot going on. Can you share some of your observations with the conflict between human beings while creating opera and some solutions to those conflicts. Yeah, well, like I said earlier, I think communication is key. A lot of times, if, if, if there's communication problems within the team that's creating the, the production, then that's where you know, we start to see really strong personalities conflicting um, just because things might have been miscommunicated mm -hmm. or we didn't involve everyone in the uh -huh. decision making mm -hmm. the way that we should have or, or something like that. So yeah, in addition to the, the conflict that you mentioned is, is pretend, the representation of these stories, we also have the response that the performers have, right. which is a real response mm -hmm. as we're creating it, and the real response of the audience members. Um, so if we look at, at a piece like Electra, for example, or um, Dead Man Walking mm. uh, or, or um, one of these shows with uh, Dialogues of the Carmelites uh, and both of those are, are real events mm -hmm. that are being depicted yep. and it, gets, it can get really heavy for the performers as well to, to have to experience depicting these things like if you're as a performer you have to go on stage and assault someone or something mm -hmm. like that then we also have to keep in mind Ways to ways to take care of our audience in experiencing that, and taking care of ourselves as we experience that, and have to have to um, convey that story. Um, so, um, uh, on a few productions of like Dead Man or Carmelites or, or the heavier subject matter, Electra will be like that as well. You'll see people, you know, do the scene, and this horrific thing will take place, and then we'll stop, and it'll be like smiles, high fives, things to disconnect mm -hmm. from that, and remind ourselves that this is not actually happening to us right now. And and um, so there is there's a, a burden on the on the artists as well in, mm -hmm. in depicting these conflicts. I am so glad you said that. I need everybody to listen to that. I say this as an artist. Um, I was on the stage before I was in in the offices as an administrator, and so that makes me have a very unique perspective. Same thing with my colleague here. We know what it's like to be in the crook of that piano doing that audition. You know, you know what it's like to be on keys <laughs> playing for that audition. Um, but also in those moments where you're depicting something very difficult on stage, and I, I, I say this and I'm going to say it, you know where I'm headed, <laughs> but be very careful about the, the repertoire that you pick. Oh, yeah, yeah. But also about things that you put in place for those artists and for that creative team and for that office that's responsible for producing and cutting the checks forward and all of those things that happen on the business side. Because there are real things that happen on stage that depict real life. We had Everest here, you know, and that affected somebody right here in our city and he allowed us to tell his story. And it was a very difficult story to tell. And I'll never forget looking up and seeing Dr. Beth Beck Weathers in the box seat. I was on the orchestra floor and I looked up and he was standing and applauding with tears running down his face. He had just saw himself depicted on stage, his daughter on stage, right? And that was his real expression. But when you also talk to the artists from those productions, talking about meeting him and having that conversation, this is real, right? This is what we're doing with art. This is the point. This is one of the points. But we have to be mindful of the caretaking that it takes to, to do something like that and how real it is on stage, you know, and, and how it can hit home for people. And I say this because there's a lot of art coming out now where we're depicting things like police brutality. We are talking about things like racial dy dynamics. We're talking about anti-LGBTQIA. There are real topics on stage. Remember to care for the folks in charge of portraying it and the folks that are producing it. 
And I would say not even just remember, make it a priority. Correct. What we learn and what we continue to learn even here at the Dallas Opera is that when you create a space where people in their humanity can be supported, doesn't mean it's going to be easier. No. It is still, right? She's, not at equity all. is hot. It's hot. <laughs> it's hot in it's here. It's hot when you're trying uh, to do it. It does not mean that it, it is easier, but what does start to happen is people have the space to be acknowledged. People have the space to ask questions. People have the space and the support to be creative. The biggest treasure that we have in this industry is that our creativity stems from our humanity. If I shut down your humanity, what am I doing to your creativity? But I expect you to go in there and go perform this. I don't care what just happened to you before. I don't care how much this scene resonates with you. I don't care if you need a break. Why aren't you being professional? Go do it. As opposed to, okay, let's take some time. What would you like to do differently? And now we have more voices in the space. Now we have more support in the space. And now we have a different way that we can approach this. And if you make that a priority long before folks get here, long before the, the, the repertoire is chosen, if you make it a point to do that, it needs to be as essential as balancing your budgets. It needs to be as essential as cutting checks. Because again, the reason why you're doing all of those things is because the people, it's the human resources that put this on stage. Okay, and that portrayed this on stage. Um, would any of the panelists like to weigh in on this outside of? Um, yeah, I think, I think to your point, like creativity, it comes from safety, mm -hmm. right? And the research shows that, is that when our brains feel safe, we can be our, the most human, right? And so we get into any kind of organization, right? Not just mm -hmm. the opera, yep. and we see people leave and whatever, and it's because there's no safety. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about conflict, Conflict at its best is because there's safety between people, Absolutely. safety between even self, right? Like understanding that, oh, I can manage this. I can, yeah, I have two things going on here, but I can trust myself to do this work for me. Um, and so when we want creativity, we have to breed safety. That's a word. <laughs> Fire. Dr. Cheryl? It reminds me of... Um, the fact that there are things that we need at the foundation and safety is one. Um, in order for us to be vulnerable, being able to check within ourselves to make sure that we can support ourselves the way we need to, being sure that I can look across the room and know that this person can support me enough that if I speak my truth, that it doesn't slap me in the face, requires me to feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, for me to be able to sit on this stage right now requires me to feel safe. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me to talk about what I'm talking about today requires me to feel safe. For me to get up and move forward in what I have to do for the rest of the day requires me being safe. So I agree with everything I've heard on the panel. Um, and I just feel like also something was said earlier about like sharing the awareness. And at the very end, I want to give some homework, right? So as a student, I used to wonder, like I'm at school. Why do we get homework? Why am I doing work at home for school, right? <laughs> but I realized that homework is not necessarily about school. It's about ownership. Mm -hmm. When you go home and you actually take out the time to understand what's being taught at school, so when you take out the time to understand what's being said on this panel, and then you take ownership and you start doing your work, that means that you too are playing a part in the positive part of conflict. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so yeah, but that does require being safe. Dr. Cheryl just mentioned vulnerability and yeah. quote, you had said earlier that opera artists are very vulnerable yes. um, in, by putting themselves out there on stage and telling these stories. And so um, speaking to like what is required in the room, that safety is, is paramount, right? So then we have to move away from the sort of um, stereotypes of opera of having like these dictator type directors or conductors or, or whatever and and you know having it be about perfection and and yeah. you know everyone yeah. kind of cowering and and have these and safe spaces sing. to create exactly <laughs> yeah and yeah. to be sure that does not mean that we don't put out quality and that yes. we don't pay attention. Yeah. This, this is not a conversation of quality or humanity. Play it. We can have both. <laughs> like, yes. we need it. Why not? Yes. It's a conversation about the brain uh -huh. and, and the heart. Yep, talk yes. about it. And what this does allow us to do is to pay attention to the collaborative nature of opera. 
So much of opera is about collaboration. I cannot do one thing that will not impact someone else's job. Correct. In this art form, in business, in life, right? But directly in this art form. So when we look at allowing people to be vulnerable and creating safety and not having kind of a dictatorship, that does not mean don't be efficient. Efficiency comes with safety. Because we've had those conversations. I know that this is a space where if I'm experiencing something, I can say something. Mm -hmm. And I know that someone will respond. Something will be done for us to learn. Because conflict is inevitable. There will be conflict. How we respond to it then allows us to strengthen the processes that we have so that we can move forward. So that we can get to the art. In mm -hmm. fact, so that we can participate in the art making of art making. Mm -hmm. If that you know, I'm gonna put it that makes out sense. there. <laughs> you, I always say the, the show, the, the 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 real show is backstage. The real show is backstage. <laughs> the real show is backstage. Uh, so then this leads me to what some people experience and what it's like in those real time moments. We know that opera tells human stories. We know that people are impacted by these stories. Is it fair to expect a type of objectivity or disassociation or distancing? from individuals, from artists, from staff members whose lived experience kind of directly resonates with the story itself. So we're telling a story about family, we're telling a story about police brutality, we're telling stories about uh, losing loved ones. How fair is it to expect artists and staff and audience to create a distance between themselves and that experience? I think it's impossible. I say that. Say that one more time. Yeah, yeah. I think it's impossible to create objectivity. We are, um, we, American culture is so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna, but we we just we think that we're individuals, right? Like we think that like I am my own person, but actually we're a a pool of everything that's ever happened to us and everything we've ever yeah, read and seen Energetic. and heard and and whatnot. And so even if the story doesn't touch on my own personal lived experience it touches on humanness and I Absolutely. don't remove that for I can't I can't go into an opera and say like okay I'm not gonna be human anymore just so I can enjoy this right and the best the best of art is when I am moved by it right Absolutely. that is why we tell stories is because we're, we're advocating for change we're advocating for um, like knowledge and the, the heart of that is not objectivity is the hope is that when an artist goes up there, they interact, is that they will put themselves into that and bring it alive, right? And, and the way we connect with that is through our humanity, our humanness, even if it's not our own personal lived experience. We add that part and that's a whole, right? Like that's a whole other thing. How am I supposed to not interact with that when, it, when it's right in front of me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say um, the same, it's impossible. Um, when we consider the heart and the brain, it's impossible because our experiences, our emotions, our culture, cultural, our culture, <laughs> our religious background, it shapes our understanding of the world that we live in. Um, and when we've had experiences that we see in front of us, it can be traumatizing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And as Hilda pointed out earlier, trauma lives in the body. Mm -hmm. So our mind and our heart is in our body. Yeah. <laughs> and if we're traumatized, our mind and our hearts are traumatized. They can't function in the way they need to function anyway. And to me, to expect for someone to do that is cruel. Yeah. It's inhumane. Yeah. It's the opposite of what we're trying to bring out. And for whose entertainment exactly? So if we're going to talk truth and we're going to talk real and we're going to talk about what life really is, we need to understand that everyone is affected by everything. We're energetic beings. And I may not be in I may not be directly affected by something that Christian is is affected by. But empathy can connect. And it may not even be the same thing, but that pain that she feels, I may have experienced it in a di on a different level in a different way. But these emotions, we all have. We all have them. Just like we all have blood coursing through our veins. Mm -hmm. They may be different, just like our skin color is different. Mm -hmm. But it's the same. 
And until we can realize that Christian's experience is a human experience, which means it's my experience too, because I'm human, right? We're forever lost. And this is why conflict resides. Because dictatorship says do it the way I say do it, based off how I feel about it, based off what I think about it, and put the way you feel on the back burner. So what do we do when we do that? We create more trauma. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We create more issues. And we talked earlier about the intra-conflict, the intra-conflict uh, that we have. So when you put people in those positions, they're re-traumatized, they go and suffer in silence. You don't really know until you hear about them on the news somewhere, Romeo and Juliet. So it's important that we understand that this idea, now don't get me wrong, (laughs) absolute objectivity is needed. It's essential for science, it's essential for law, where decisions should be based on evidence and reason, which we all know that there are many times that it's not, but it should be based on evidence and reason rather than personal beliefs and or interest. Um, There are areas though in which it is important that we take a look at people's lived experiences because it makes a difference for them and for those around them. I saw a quote on my social media that was relevant to to this panel, which was, theater is a gym for empathy. (laughs) So that's where we we exercise our empathy muscles. Absolutely. Um, And I think, you know, as we're... um, considering more and more what the lived experiences of our performers, of our audiences are, then you're seeing different ways of, of dealing with both the process of, of um, putting on uh, a performance and watching. Um, I've been to a number of productions now where there have been um, therapists and trauma counselors mm-hmm. available for the artists and and for audience members, depending on what what the subject matter is, um, you've seen uh, things like intimacy directors mm-hmm. involved in productions now, so that those moments on stage are done in a safe way that respects everyone involved, and that we don't just you know go up and touch someone without without talking mm-hmm. about it first. So I think you know these these issues have have really come to the fore in the past few years and and so we're seeing a lot of of new ways to try to deal with it. And I'll say even in my experience I've served as a racial healing practitioner for again we got a lot of we got a lot of operas and stories coming out in particular about violence about systems of oppression Mm -hmm. which you can't speak about systems of oppression in the United States without talking about race and racism. It has to be at the foundation of any type of justice work we're doing. And so as a racial healing practitioner, I've been in spaces with artists who see props and suddenly can no longer sing. I've been in spaces with artists who are asking, why is this story so difficult? Mm -hmm. Why did they choose this story? And as we tell stories, we will be telling difficult stories in opera. This isn't to say not to tell those stories, but I I lean into what Dr. Scholl said, for whose entertainment, for Mm -hmm. who is this conversation for, and how are we supporting artists in being stewards of this conversation and of this experience, even if it's not their lived experience, but there's a proximity there. No, and, and this is real in real time. You know, mm-hmm. when you're depicting mm-hmm. things that people can walk out of their house and see, you know, and then say, here, sing this aria about this. It can be really tough on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have to think about this. So I'm really glad you brought up the point about intimacy directors and, and psychologists and such, because more and more increasingly, we're seeing that in pretty much all theater spaces, actually, not just in the opera theater. So we're, we're seeing that we would like to see more yeah, yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah, everybody's mental wellness matters. So exactly. Absolutely. Lean in, do it. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. So I think, um, I, I know we're, we're getting dangerously close uh, mm-hmm. to the mark. Uh, we're going to get the hand signals in a minute. We already got our 20, by the way. So uh, <laughs> this is, we just got started. No. Um, one of the things I do want to talk about a little bit, though, um, we know that there are communities that, that face greater discrimination and systemic barriers. Um, Continuous threat, continuous threat. Let's be real about it. 
This can happen in an opera house where people are going to their seats, you know, or trying to enjoy the performance. What are some courageous ways organizations can work to address this uh, issue? And I will pose that to Dr. Cheryl first. Um, I would say first and foremost, identify the conflicts, identify the issues, right? Identify what's really there. That means possibly, you know, I don't know, you, maybe evaluations, maybe surveys. In when you hear things, listen to what people are saying, allow them to express themselves, pay attention to what they're saying, pay attention to what they're talking about, be aware of and respect differences. Acknowledge different opinions. And I think building a consensus of what's the best way to deal with things is really, really important. It makes it possible to set aside things that prevent the work from being done. Because mm -hmm. it's important for it to be done. But first and foremost, I think it's important just to identify what the conflicts are and create healthy boundaries around them. Mm -hmm. And not slide away from those. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, to just be... Um, be about what you say you're going to be about, hmm. right? Um, one example, because I was a little confused about like what exactly this question was kind of referencing, and I think that one thing was, um, you know, someone, you know, making a comment. You come to sit down. Oh, I like your hair. What do you? What is that called? Or you know, things like that. Um, and I can see how an organization can say, well, I can't really do anything about that. But you can. You can have conversations around it. Mm -hmm. You can do things like we're doing right now. Um, you can bring about the awarenesses. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's really important. But more than anything, let's not run away from these topics. Mm -hmm. Let's not be afraid to talk about them. N let's not be afraid, like Adam said, to communicate. And here's the thing I like to put on that. Communi let's communicate effectively. Um, I think that's important because people think that they communicate and, and you do. How you communicate is important just as much as communicating. So communicating effectively is important. So how do we do that? By being sure that we take out the time that's needed to understand what communication really is about. I don't want to talk to Christian and in my head be having a whole conversation while Christian is talking. Mm. I'm talking to Christian to hear and understand what's going on mm -hmm. with Christian so that I can then See how I, if any way possible, can make a difference in that situation. And listen, if I can't, I've listened enough to be able to say, I want to let you know I empathize with that. But me, I have resources. Let me send you somewhere. <laughs> That's one thing I always keep in the back of my pocket is resources. Because I'm not, I can't be everything to all people. But it is important to know that it is, it is our responsibility to make sure that the next person mm -hmm. is okay. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I wanna bring this back a little bit because um, we talk about it in terms of audience, but you know, we have administrative staff, right. yeah. you know, that, are, that can be responsible for, for doing this, but we also have things that happen in the internal community on administrative staffs. And so I wanna pose this question to Hilda. Um, we chatted about some of the behaviors that that are exhibited when experiencing conflict, how does this show up in the workplace? We talked about the stage, <laughs> we talked about you know, making sure your audience is comfortable, we talked about the artist. Let's talk about the administrative yeah. space. Absolutely. Um, so sometimes we'll see this in, like we're just not gonna talk about the conflict, not gonna even, no, we don't talk about Bruno kind of thing, right? <laughs> we don't talk about Bruno. We don't talk about Bruno, um, except we're gonna sing a whole number and we're gonna whisper behind, right? Like that's actually uh -huh. real reality. And let the that's theme it, come yes, back right. over yeah, and over Yeah, again. yeah, I yeah. I won't talk to the actual person that I have the conflict with, but I will talk to everyone else in the office about it. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes it, it comes from uh, like fear, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. fear yeah. that if we were to have the conversation, I'll lose my job or there'll be um, repercussions for that or, you know, whatever, whatever the fear, the fear is. And so a lot of times organizations or administrative workplaces, it, it's about, hey, how do we make this a safe place for conflict? When I say that I have an open door policy, what does that mm -hmm. look like? What does mm -hmm. that mean? And how do I make sure that I am a person of my word? when it goes about, when I go about this. Um, so oftentimes conflict has a lot more to do with us than it does with other people. And, Absolutely. and how do organizations, um, administrative offices, 
right, make space for people to do their own internal work. Not to say that, right, like you come to, to work and your boss is like walking you through a therapy session, mm -hmm. but so much of it is that we, are, we refuse to look at ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Like when we talk about racial healing, when we talk about just like any kind of conflict, mm -hmm. so oftentimes is we have a knee-jerk reaction to it, but we aren't willing to step, step back and say like, why am I feeling uncomfortable about this? Yeah. What, is, what, is, what, is, what am I playing into? You know, uh, go like I do a lot of trauma work, so I go back to childhood a ton. Mm -hmm. Oh, this actually reminds me of how my dad talked to my mom, and that's mm -hmm. what's making me really fearful mm -hmm. about this conversation um, with my boss. And so, so, you know, you see it in a lot of different ways, but the biggest thing is, like, how do we hold empathy and space for people to kind of take a yeah. step back and say, hey, this is not personal to me. How can I enter into this with them and their own conflict response? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other Thoughts on this? Beautiful. Uh -huh. um, so, as oh, wait, we. I think we. Oh, I think, oh did I? I'm sorry. Go that's for okay. It. Um, <laughs> I did. I had to remind myself I did talk about homework, right? So, I want to go back to what I said at first. Conflict is the result of humor, human interaction, it's not a bad thing, right? It doesn't have to be a problem. It can be transformative, it has transformative abilities, but that will require us to have conversations, Adam. I agree, Hilda. It's also about accountability. Where is this conf what is this conflict really about for me? For me, what is it really about? For me, not for Adam and what Adam said to me. <laughs> not for Hilda and what she did to me. But for me, what is this conflict about for me? And then I also need to recognize if I just wanna be in conflict with Adam, <laughs> if I just haven't learned how to not be in conflict with Hilda, and it kind of feels good being in conflict even though it doesn't feel good because we do know that we get very comfortable in our discomfort, uh -huh. especially if we're used to it. So it's important to have conversations where we can create change in ourselves, create change in our relationships, and create change in the world around us, but it requires us to be vulnerable. So we have to be willing to be seen though Right, and then you're right, Quo, we have to create safety around that, right? Um, but that also means taking off this armor of justification. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Putting down blame, right? Um, creating potential to connect. Again, I have to want to connect with you, Adam, right? Then ownership. There we go, Hilda. It is always showing up. Ownership is taking accountability, y'all, y'all. <laughs> it's about understanding our own needs and wants and responsibilities because we all have a responsibility in this communication Adam we, you, we talked about communication this whole time we set up here right but it's learning to ask how are you Quo and listen and then I can express because what am I expressing if I haven't listened Right? And the best way for us to communicate is by asking questions. If I want to know something about someone, I'm going to ask. I'm not going to ask Quo to tell me about Hilda. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask Christian, why is Adam such a jerk? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to create those external conflicts. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm going to take responsibility. And then there's acceptance. And so we embrace the reality of letting go sometimes as well, guys. We, we got to let go of what we cannot control. So sometimes in conflict, avoidance is good when people are not in a place to hear you. Hmm. Right? But acceptance can also mean letting go of trying to fix it. You know? Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is my favorite. And I talk about it all the time. And that's setting healthy boundaries. We gotta have some ground rules. We have to have acceptable behavior. And we need to understand that that behavior is based off of individuals' experiences. So I wanna leave you guys with vocab, <laughs> right? We talked about communication, so this is vocab. So vocab stands for vulnerability, ownership, communication, acceptance, and boundaries. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for ushering us into kind of these spaces of final thoughts. Yep. I love that. Um, thank you for that, Dr. Cheryl. I'm going to ask 
Hilda and then Adam, can you provide us with any last thoughts or final thoughts you'd like for people to consider when it comes to the brain and the heart, which are not separate, right? Because so much, this is our, our system. So much is happening here. We say we feel it here. It's all happening in one being. And the ways that people can start to lean into conflict. So I, I'm, I'm a big believer in living according to your values. Mm. Um, and what I mean by that is, one, identifying what's important to you and then figuring out how to move in those ways. Right? When we talk about like confidence, sometimes confidence is that you're just not living up to who you want to be. Right? And so when it comes to conflict, figuring out what is the value in this? Like, is it connection? Is it, um, is it important to have advocacy? Like, what is the, the, the goal and aligned with your value and then move in those ways, right? So if gossiping isn't getting you to that goal, then let's not do it. Yeah. And let's move into those spaces where that I'm actually honoring the person I wanna be in the world. Yeah. Um, and that really eliminates a lot of the external variables, right? So if I am in conflict with Christian and my goal is to be like, hey, I want to be open and receptive and vulnerable and, sh and I move in those ways and she refuses to do that. Okay, well, I have lived according to my own value system. Stay on mission. Yeah. Stay, stay on stay your on mission. mission. Yes. Yeah. I talk a lot to my clients about like, this is my home. How do I come home to myself? Yeah. And just like if I walk into my physical home and there's a painting I don't like, I just change it, right? Like I, I'm like, okay, this is not working anymore. And so how do we do that with our heart and our, and our brain? How do I create a home within myself that the way I act and behave and go about the world is in line with like showing up and being cozy at home in a mm -hmm. physical space? And so when it comes to conflict, just coming back to that, moving in the ways that honors the person you wanna be. Awesome. Adam? I started by saying like the brain and the heart conversation makes me think about decision making and uh -huh. how we respond. Mm -hmm. So I think for my final words, um, just when you come to the opera, take some time to think about how you're responding to what mm -hmm. you're seeing and to these stories and how they are portrayed. And, and think about what stories you would like to see up there. Mm -hmm. And then make sure you're communicating that to your arts organizations mm -hmm. so that we can incorporate, like, so that we can continue to create uh, important and relevant work. And arts organizations listen. Because the audience will tell you what they want to see. Um, and, they, and, and it will reflect what they want to see in, in, in their own lives and their lives experience a lot of the time. So if they say we would like to see more stories like this, pay attention. It's important, particularly as we continue to move into the 21st century in this art form. Well, I, uh, I, I want to see, check, and check the room, see if there are any questions. Did we get any questions online, folks? No questions online, just I had to check. Um, any questions here in the room now about anything that you've heard? We'd like to open the floor for anything. We're also you know, open to talking to you afterwards if you don't want to put your collective business on the street, <laughs> on a live stream. <laughs> business out here in these streets. Yes, yes, this, this, in these opera streets. Um, well, then, then we'll wrap. I, I wanted to say um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Quo. Of course, I enjoy working with my lovely friend, my sister, and my co-host. Um, these wonderful panelists that we have had here today, um, thank you for taking your uh, afternoon out to be with us. Thank you for bringing your expertise um, from, from different walks of life. Um, thank you so much for being open and being in the space. I hope that you have felt supported and appreciated today. That is the goal here, um, particularly when we're talking about items of this nature. Uh, quote, any final thoughts on your end? Yes. Uh, also, gratitude to each of you for your beautiful, amazing work, for your commitment to these spaces, not just of belonging, but of creativity, of humanity, of storytelling. You're all storytellers and story bearers in your own right as well. Uh, to all of our audience, people who are here, thank you for our online folks. Thank you for joining us. Please do continue to check out the TDO Connections programming. If you have not already gotten your tickets for the season, get Please, them. Please, get your tickets. Get them. And we okay. encourage you to go and to see the humanity that happens on stage. Be mindful of the humanity that took place in order to create these stories. Be mindful of your own humanity and what that means as you connect from person to person, from brain to heart. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all so much. Have a good rest of the day. Mm -hmm.